Hold on to your butts. We are changing the course of history as we see it. That is what Wesker demands. Now this affects Iris. Um, Iris, where are you? What you feel only matters to you. I do not entertain hypotheticals. The world as it is is vexing enough. Iris, I have a tip for you. Don't take drugs! Or whatever movies with Wesley and Iris. What up and welcome to Or Whatever Movies. I'm your co-host Iris and I'm here with my older brother, Wesley. Today we're talking a film from 2021, Oscar-nominated Best Picture West Side Story. West Side? Um, 2021, don't you mean 1961? Or 1957? For the stage musical originally. Yes, 1957 stage musical, 1961, what was that, Best Picture? Best Picture, yeah, and like 10 other awards or 13 other awards. It was a big deal. Has such a big movie been remade? Yeah, well, there's like a Night to Remember became Titanic and stuff. I mean, it's a it's a little <laughs> bit different because it's a historic event, but... This is not the first time Steven Spielberg remade a movie. He did War of the Worlds. That was a big movie. And people remember West Side Story because the soundtrack is, you know, still being sold today. And everybody knows those songs. I knew those songs. And frankly, come at me, bro, I never saw the original West Side Story. And I was like, oh, that's where that song comes from. I know exactly what song you're talking about. I feel pretty. There's a couple of them. Like, it, does it need to be remade? Is it thematically, politically, socially relevant? I don't know. Maybe there's all kinds of stuff going on in the world. But basically, it comes down to Steven Spielberg was like, I love that movie. My whole life, I've wanted to remake that movie. So I remade that movie. Simple enough. And if someone is going to remake West Side Story, it might as well be Steven Spielberg. I actually wondered for a second if it was directed by J.J. Abrams, because we have lots of lens flares. But it looked very 1950s, 1960s. Mm-hmm. It looked very much like that. It has this washed out Janusz Kaminski cinematography feel where the Mm. colors don't pop. They're kind of muted and it's kinetic and dynamic. And and it's hard to get a sense of, quote unquote, realism if you're dancing and cavorting (laughs) in the streets and and yelling in Spanish. Well, that's just endemic to any musical and and your problem. Exactly. And thankfully, if I'm coming at a a musical where I don't know anything, I'm immediately resistant. I'm like, okay, because these songs don't feel good. They don't feel familiar. They feel like a distraction. They feel like a diversion. Mm -hmm. But this Mm -hmm. one sometimes against my will or against uh, all odds. I was like, oh, that song. And, And in a weird way, it fits better if you know the song. Maybe that's not a weird way. Because Kelly was like, Hamilton would have been so much better if I knew the songs going in. And my instinct is that's directly contrary to movies. You don't want to know everything about a movie before you go in. But if you can sing along and if you're not trying to process Lin-Manuel Miranda's rapping, maybe it's easier. We talked about it in in stuff like Encanto and Tick, Tick, Boom. Yeah, and relevant to Tick, Tick, Boom, right? This was Sondheim's first lyrics, Um, musical lyrics. Bernstein, I think, and Sondheim, yeah. And Sondheim obviously playing a mentor-like role to Jonathan Larson in Tick, Tick, Boom. A West Side Story, a hugely influential musical in the world of musical theater, probably influenced Jonathan Larson and his contemporaries. What's interesting about West Side Story is that, as far as I understand, when it debuted on Broadway, it was a contemporary piece. Like, it premiered in the 50s and it was set in the 50s. Right. I don't understand why West Side Story continues to be set in the 50s. If Spielberg is going to remake this thing and its themes are universal and still relevant, like, why not update this time-wise? Isn't that in the Heights, which I also didn't see? I don't know. (laughs) I don't know if there's uh, jets and sharks and murders and and stuff in, in the Heights. But I'm also, I'm going to argue, can't believe I'm defending a musical, but I'm going to argue that the 50s aesthetic is important because the real life componentry of musicals is what I always have a hard time with. It's like, we're gonna fight, man. We're gonna rumble with our switchblades and we're dancing. And it feels weird, but because it feels like a different time, a different place for us, I'm kind of okay with it. Like the cars look funny and they make funny sounds and people have funny haircuts and stuff. And then they start dancing and I'm like, well, it's because they're in costume and makeup. They might as well. And if I honestly, if it had been completely modernized, A, Steven Spielberg doesn't have a great sense for modern kids. He probably was this age, you know, in the 50s when these kids came up and I'm okay with that. 
do what you know. Well, no one's going to stop Steven Spielberg from doing what he wants. So we get West Side Story, and that's fine. Oh, yeah. I think it did look great, although it was fantasy-like and artificial. It wasn't real, but it looked cool. Very artificial. Yeah, but we come into it, and I was like, okay, let's see what, what's going to happen. Uh-oh, Baby was in prison, and now Baby's singing, and Baby's first song sucked. Let's see where we're going. And so opening, I <laughs> was You thought very, his first song sucked? I did, and I was very pessimistic, and I was like, oh, man. And by Baby, you mean, of course, Baby Driver. And yes. in the end, did you feel like Ansel Elgort succeeded in his role as Tony? I do. Uh, he was a, l- a little bit like Ty Sheridan, where I'm like, I know that dude, and he's distractingly unique looking, I guess. But as the stoic baby and as the tough jet, I was okay with it. No, I did like his ability to sing. I wasn't aware of it. He certainly doesn't sing for all the time he spends with music and Baby Driver. But when the songs got better, he got better. And then I'm finding that he insisted that he sing a lot of this live on set. It wasn't the playback style that they typically do where they record recorded in ideal settings. And then he lip syncs to his own recording. So he was singing most of his songs were sung live on set. And Rachel Ziegler had a few of those as well, which is really cool and admirable. Like in the moment, it feels real. And uh, I'm not sure, don't quote me here, but I thought I had read something about the original West Side Story not only being recorded and played back, but wasn't them. But some of them weren't actually the ones singing. I could be completely off base. But I like the sense of immediacy and stakes that on the set while filming, he's singing those songs live. That's scary and kind of cool. I didn't realize that some of these songs were sung live, which is interesting. But is the end, isn't the end result kind of the same? Well, there is a level of artifice already built in in a movie of this sort, particularly by Steven Spielberg. But you're asking me if I thought Ansel Elgort was good and it didn't feel fake or false. Like his performance felt authentic and like we, he wasn't trying to cheat like he was a good singer. Like Ewan McGregor is a passable singer, but even he doesn't quite sell it in the way that Ansel Elgort, I think, has a really good voice and is a good actor for, you know, whatever that means. And so I was convinced by him in the Tony role. I mean, I guess that's a score for West Side Story. He and Maria, their story is central. You know, obviously, they're the Romeo and Juliet. What? Nothing. I just, he was good enough. So he didn't feel to me like an ancillary character. Good one. I wonder if he's ever gotten that one before. (laughs) Um, I did think, like, chemistry-wise, that he had a good ex-jet thing going (laughs) he's still young but he's got this kind of imposing manly figure but then he's got these soft puffy lips and this sensitive looking face and he's kind of pretty and he seemed like the sensitive type who could get in a knife fight but also and survive prison but also you know have a real soft spot for maria and be all googly eyed for her and likewise rachel zegler as maria she felt fitting but she also kind of felt like a cartoon character to me like with her very dramatic features Super and her wide melodramatic eyes. acting. Yeah. So there was that one shot that featured heavily in the trailer where she kind of leans forward all eager with eyes shining in the moonlight and she's like about to be like, tonight. But it's like so picture perfect and she's so lovely looking and exactly in place in a 1950s musical. It almost, it made me wonder like, why are we remaking this 1961 film if it looks exactly like this 1961 film? She does have cartoony features, but she also looks ideal and idealized and perfect perfectly in place within the scope of that role for that time period and for what if Steven Spielberg were doing his thing back then it probably would have looked exactly like this you know given his maturity as a filmmaker and in that way I want to say that she fit nicely into that vibe and kind of nowhere nowhere else you're like she's a perfect Maria and Steven Spielberg said the same thing And then she goes on like talk shows or whatever. And she was like, that was crazy. It was like a year of my life. And I was like, I didn't get that shit. And then I was like, whoa. And you're like, wait, wait, no. Rachel Ziegler, you're only Maria. Only Maria and all quiet and 16 years old or whatever. So is there such a thing as too perfect? Maybe not in this kind of very artificial, fantastical world. I don't think so. I don't think there's too spot on for this. I mean, all of the sharks are of... Latino descent or whatever and 
that's a big deal for Steven Spielberg. We didn't have subtitles because he didn't even want that to suppose that English trumped that language. It was going to stand on its own. And all that real representation is fine. I got no problem with that at all, as long as it fits and it works. Uh, my best example of this is Riff. This guy, Mike Faced. I looked at his mm -hmm. filmography. I've never seen another thing this dude has done. And he is so perfect as that <laughs> character. I don't ever, I hope this guy's acting career fails miserably. And I only ever have to see him in this role because he <laughs> was so riff and so kind of cool and so perfectly cast. A working Broadway actor, I think. Well, he's he has a number of film roles as well. But he was so, he was like River Phoenix kind of pretty, but also <laughs> severe looking. And James Dean type, like an unlikely kind of dude. And his was a tragic end and stuff. I guess he was the Mercutio role. And a very contrasting voice to Ansel Elgort. I, I don't know anything about this dude. I was like, that dude's riff. And that's all I want from him ever. And so in that way, I, I'm not sure that on the nose is a bad thing. I think that uh, it was just right. Probably the same can be said for Corey Stoll. Kind of playing the Corey Stoll role. <laughs> I don't have too much of a basis. I'm looking at Lieutenant Shrank, and I'm like, which one is Shrank? He's not Krupke. No, Shrank was the racist detective that breaks up the first rumble. And maybe that's also where we can land. Only in 1950s New York can we still be racist and swear and smoke and stab on screen like this. <laughs> right? If we updated it, it would be all in the Heights neutered or whatever. I don't know. I haven't seen that movie. So are you on IMDb right now? Yeah. So look at the cast. Yes. And look at the headshot for David Alvarez, who played Bernardo. Yep. And you're talking about perfectly cast, especially in a Steven Spielberg role. This dude was obviously the Puerto Rican Shia LaBeouf, right? <laughs> well, that headshot, in that headshot specifically, yes. And that makes me happy that it so clearly illustrates what I'm saying. But I got that vibe for the whole movie. I mean, Shia LaBeouf played Brown in The Tax Collector, and that was kind mm. of a big thing. He was a white dude, but he was playing a very ethnic, cultural depiction. Yes. Right? But so it's a shame could, that Shia LaBeouf and Steven Spielberg had a falling out. And so we have David Alvarez, who looks just like him. And that's not to impugn his skill, I'm sure. He's great. He's great, Bernardo. Yeah, he's great. He's just, he. I was like, that dude looks like Shia. <laughs> he was a great Bernardo. And I think he's a great example of this kind of perfectly imperfect thing that's going on in West Side Story. He's like in perfectly dirty clothes with perfectly marked dirty marks on his face and blood marks on his face. And all of his gang, you know, they send around a memo in the morning and they're like, let's wear colors in the maroon spectrum. And then all the sharks send out an email and they're like, black <laughs> leather today. And then they're like all perfectly street and imperfect. Yep. Really, this kind of applies to all the characters. Like I'm going down the line and wasn't Ariana DeBose as Anita, perfectly Anita. In fact, she reminded me a lot, and forgive me if this is kind of racist, but did she give any cha-cha vibes to you? Yeah, well, she did. Didn't someone say cha-cha at one point? Like, wasn't that a nickname or she said the words or something? Do you know who I'm talking about? Of course, from Greece, Cha-Cha Cha -Cha de Gregorio and Danny Zuko, because I'm the best dancer at St. Bernadette. So I'm talking about my disdain generally for musicals, and I know Greece by heart. Right, exactly, very ironic. Well, I think it was some of the frilly uh, frilly dress, which I think in Cha-Cha's case was the Mexican frills and her shaking them all around. It was very like hands on the hem of her skirt, like whipping it around kind of thing <laughs> is what gave me those vibes. The Cha-Cha vibes. Even she was concerned, having played the role of Anita before, that she was just too dark looking for the role, especially to play Rachel Zegler's sister. And Steven Spielberg was like, no, you're great. And I agree. I think she's great. And it's all good. And she's kind of the most standy outie. She just recently won the uh, Screen Actors Guild Award for this role. And uh, she seems to be getting the most attention from the main cast. Well, yeah. I mean, Oscar nominated Best Supporting Role. She's good. See, when we're talking about perfect casting and maybe too perfect and too on the nose, I'm sure there are legions of people, not listening to this podcast, but who are like, oh, I love West Side Story and I love musical so much. And why would they remake it? It's perfect as it is. I think it was Rita Moreno who plays a different role. She was the original Maria who said that she believes that the original West Side Story was perfect. And I'm sure there are a lot of people that being like, I mean, Ariana DeBose is good, but she's never going to be my Anita. You know what I mean? It's, we're already playing against an alternate, like a multiverse version. 
of these characters. But you're not saying that Rita Moreno was dissing West Side Story, the no, current man, version. No, man, she's in this one, playing a different role. The, the, the role she plays, which is the lady that Tony works with. Yeah, Valentina. She is the widow of the character originally in that role in, in West Side Story. I don't know if you saw it or not, but they, they changed it to fit her for this movie because she's a legend in West Side Story. The original. Yep, and subsequently. And still looks great and still has her moment to sing. And uh, nice to see you. So of the awards, of the seven Academy Awards that West Side Story 2021 is nominated for, do you think it's got a chance? I honestly don't. Giving this to Steven Spielberg when he's been not in nothing but a downturn for the last... Honestly, I think his last big movie that was like overtly successful, unequivocally successful, even though it didn't win Best Picture, which was a crime, was Saving Private Ryan. If you look at all his subsequent movies in one way or another, they've been kind of a disappointment. Name a, a Steven Spielberg classic from the last 20 years. And he, he could be safe in this role. It still bombed terribly. It still didn't make back its budget. What, West Side Story? Yeah, wildly critically lauded and adored by fans, supposedly. Rewarded with seven nominations. Still didn't make a dollar. Yeah, come on. Every bit of success this movie has had has everything to do with Steven Spielberg. And perhaps its lack of success is unrelated. It's the theatrical climate and the climate in the world. And the, the shifting dynamic and access to movies, to streaming. And I don't think that anybody who invested who put money into West Side Story is going to be disappointed in the long term. You think it'll stand and eventually find a new audience and and maybe even replace the old one in the hearts and minds of Generation uh, Z plus one or whatever? I don't know that this has captured the hearts and minds of the current generation. I don't think this is the definitive West Side Story, but I think it's going to have a nice long life on HBO Max and Disney Plus thereafter, and people will continue to watch it, and it will continue to make money, and everyone will be happy, and it will be fine. My forecast for West Side Story is no regrets and sunny skies, and it was fine. It will be, it, it was fine, it will be fine. Curious on that note, Steven Spielberg, obviously known for DreamWorks, which is definitely still in effect, is making West Side Story for 20th Century, which is the rebranding of Fox since its acquisition by Disney. Yeah, so this will live on. So it'll have a run on HBO Max and then it will live on forever on the new incarnation of Disney Plus, whatever that becomes. Wait, are they changing it? Well, they're layering in adult fare. They're going to be adding their first rated R movies. And they're going to open themselves up to a wider audience as well as potentially offering that free ad supported version of Disney Plus. OK, good. Is it still going to cost five bucks? I want more content. I don't want to pay more. <laughs> Man, it's so crazy. The voracious content monster that we the public are, especially in pandemic times. Like I've had multiple parents be like, my kids have seen everything on Disney Plus. Like Disney Plus cannot keep up with the appetite. Yep, it's viewers. on demand, and we demand it. That's our right. And I watched West Side Story, which is long, and had some cool dancing, I guess, and and looked great. I mean, the use of shadows, the the staging, the the in your face lights, you know, kind of cut up by bodies moving across the frame and dancing and stuff. All that it looked really good. It just never looked real. It was like a graphic novel of a gangland story in 1950s New York. It was made to look like a classic. It was embracing its artificiality. And I think that is largely led by the story itself, which is timeless and centered around a love story that's kind of unfounded. I mean, really, do you find that kind of love like Maria and Tony do or that Romeo and Juliet do by like simply seeing each other? Yeah, they're teenagers. It's not like they were doing a class project together. They just saw each other across a crowded dance floor. What I'm, say what I'm saying is we're only reviewing and discussing West Side Story because it's a Best Picture nomination. Yeah. Neither Wesley or I are qualified to talk about musicals. You know, it turns out not huge fans of musicals. And I think it's always in contrast to the mega fans of musicals, the people who come to West Side Story knowing all the songs by heart and having performed in their own versions of West Side Story in their, at their school or in their community <laughs> theater. Like, 
And it's just kind of unfortunate because those are the listeners I think would be seeking out a podcast discussion on West Side Story. And I'm afraid that they're going to come to this episode and be really disappointed. Uh, sorry, dudes, we're not your dudes. Well, the, the perspective we can offer is that it is important that this movie stand on its own, not stand on the shoulders of the 1961 giant 60 years ago. There's nobody from that time who's like, I love that, you know, unless they're like, I love that because they're like 80 years old and, and more. And also that this movie not rest on the laurels of Steven Spielberg, which I don't think it does. I think that Steven Spielberg did not phone this in. He didn't, but it's uniquely and totally Steven Spielberg, don't you think? Yeah, in that kind of magical fantastical way yeah i do think the dated look is critical to sell the artifice of this movie to sell the fact that it's a musical it was like back in those days maybe people did burst into song and it has to justify this total disregard for reality whatever that means in the scope of this movie i remember and i wrote it down i cannot remember exactly because i cannot believe that this is the case at one point did like a car or a cop car try to chase down a dude who was dancing down the street like was it like oh man the cops let's scram and then he like went dancing away <laughs> well if they're gonna move they might as well dance if they're gonna talk they might as well sing if they're gonna have a major street performance the cars the beautiful pastel 50s and 60s cars might as well park in the middle of the scene right right all all in a row like like classic cars do now. They're talking yeah. and then they're dancing and then they're singing and then they're getting married, impromptu marriage in like act two, beginning of act two, you're like, uh oh, somebody's gonna die, right? It's all movie conventions that we've been conditioned even without having seen West Side Story to understand more or less what's gonna come to pass. There was nothing in West Side Story where I was like, oh, shocking, right? Even not having seen the original version, it does follow conventions and all that's fine can't be mad at, at West Side Story or Steven Spielberg. Um, I don't have these songs by heart. The song about Maria, all I, I, the only version I knew of that song was from Grumpy or Old Men when Walter hmm. Matthau sings it. And I was wow. so in pop culture, you hear versions or snippets of these songs. And I, that's kind of what West Side Story was for me. Being like, oh, that's interesting. That looks kind of cool. Wow, that looks dated. And yet it's 2021. It's like the most modern thing ever. And then just uh, understanding how pervasive this movie is, the original, at least. I kind of viewed it as a curiosity and not necessarily as anything groundbreaking, but critics love it and people love it. Doesn't mean they went to pay to see it, but hopefully it will find some level of success ultimately long run. Because to your point, I don't think Steven Spielberg is going to stop. Maybe his uh, his boundary pushing was in his youth or whatever. But uh, well, that's, you know. what I, that's what I was saying. Like Steven Spielberg totally could rest on his laurels if he wanted to on his many runaway blockbuster cinema changing successes. But it seemed like, you know, as much as this was an homage and love letter to hit one of presumably his favorite movies, it seemed like he put some real production value and thought into making this perfectly per imperfect on the screen. It, I think the action led the music, I guess. Or maybe it's the other way around. They were in the rumble and uh, you could tell or one of the fights and you could tell exactly when someone's going to hit somebody because he punctuates his sentences with it. So I'm going to do this. Bam. And then we're going to do this. Bam. Doesn't it seem like a really bad idea to like choreograph an entire scene around a gun? I'm telling you, man, only in 1961. Hey, that rhymes. But doesn't it, has it ever seemed like a good idea where it's accepted? And this happened in, uh, in Coppola's The Outsiders too, where just, it was a different time. It was like, hey, on Tuesday, we're going to do the things. Are we going to do knives or bricks? We're doing knives. Bring the knives because we're going to stick each other with the knives. And then everyone goes into a fight knowing they're going to stab each other. Like that, you got to be ultra tough, man. People from the 50s were different. I would never walk up to a dude also holding a knife, regardless if I, if I have a knife, because I'm going to get stuck and I'm probably going to have to kill them to avoid being killed. It was like the Wild uh. West, man. I, n I agree. I would never. I think that's just a really bad idea. It's like in Hamilton where they do all of the duels. Yeah. And it's like, seriously? Like, is that just a different generation of dude? 
or run away. Yes, it is. And some of it, and we talked about uh, drive my car in, in Japan and just culturally how things are different. And honor is everything. And honor is more important than death when I'm going to guess that honor doesn't matter whatsoever. But still, people go into duels. They are honor bound to do so. To turn away, to run away means they would be shunned by the people that are in their circle, the, the people that matter to them. It, it's it's a duty and a duty, frankly, that I don't share. And yes, I'm a different kind of person because I have the luxury of, of not ever having to do that. I can still say with some absurd amount of pride that I was in a real fist fight back in the seventh grade. Don't intend to be in another one uh, ever again. And knowing that I'm never going to uh. be in another fight, if I find myself in another fight, it's not going to be like, it's cool, man. It's just skins. Nobody's going to get hurt. No. I'm fighting to the death because I don't ever intend to be in that situation again. And if someone attacks me, I'm going to consider it with deadly intent. I know that sounds tough, but it's going to be more like screaming and scratching and hair pulling so I don't die. Yeah. I'm an eye gouger, or at least I imagine <laughs> yeah. in my fantasy fighting, I imagine myself to be. I keep thinking that I'm going to feign and like and like then go for the neck, like a neck chop. I've never gotten to do a neck <laughs> Like a windpipe break? Chat? Yeah, I've never gotten to do that. I don't mean between the thumb and forefinger. I mean like a high yob, flat of the hand, knife chop to the neck. I've never been able to do that. I want to see how it goes. Are you going to say hi? Yeah. I'm Japanese. I'm loud. <laughs> uh, I got choked out in Krav Maga. What? Like unconscious? No, but like they were teaching us like how to, it was my one Krav Maga class that I ever attended. And like it was me and like 12 other dudes. And so, like, I paired up with this dude who I guess was of a similar height. And then we're like, all right, so choke each other out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, all I'm saying is I'm never going to get into fighting again. And so I guess I'm going to get my fight uh, my fight fix and knife fix from West Side in Story. West Side Story and Michael Jackson's Beat It. Wow. That's some other dancing, fighting stuff. Yep. <laughs> I feel like we haven't talked about West Side Story pretty much at all. But now we know where we stand in terms of fighting. We're not yep. going to seek it out. But if it happens to us, we're not going down silently or easily. Or singing. <laughs> or you're dancing. Look, I can't. I can't. Look, we're faking the funk, man. Uh, West Side Story is not our thing. Uh, to those who, whom, you know, to those who it is, to, to, who, to who those what? To, to the people to is. whom it is, we are sorry. But there is some validity in coming to this with at least some consideration for it's the necessity for it to stand on its own. To Steven Spielberg's credit, I think it was more cinematic than most musical adaptations or, or stage play adaptations that we've seen. If Steven Spielberg hasn't created something original, has he at least presented us some a fresh take on something that we're familiar with? And I think in that sense, he succeeded. Yeah, it's an all right movie. What do you say? I'll give Westside a good. Okay, so last question. So ethnically speaking, you're more of a shark, but culturally, arguably, maybe you're more of a jet. You're married to a jet. Like, what what would you be? Do you think, if you had, if you were given the choice? That's a tough one. I think I would be. I mean, I wonder if this is one of those kinds of very like interesting and kind of dark things about this musical, and that both sets are in really tough places, and both are kind of unlikable. I mean, it's like the Jets, Shrink summed it up and said, you Jets are the guys who failed to rise above your station in life, who failed to like evolve as white people in New York. And the Puerto Ricanos were immigrants who were trying to find, you know, their place in America and fulfill the American dream. And it was really sad when Anita is like, her whole song is like, we're in America and America's great. And at the end, she's like, I'm a Puerto Rican. And her whole American dream was like crushed. And I guess so I'm I'm really trying I'm grasping here, but I'm saying maybe I'm more of a shark. Man. Maybe I'm in search of that thing. It, you obviously are a shark because you took that much deeper and more profound than I intended it. It was literally not to not to relegate these roles to like animalistic roles at all, but it was literally as simple as like Team Edward or Team Jacob. <laughs> That's our discussion on Wes Steven Spielberg's 2021 version of West Side Story available now on HBO Max and currently streaming on Disney+. Plus. This should complete all of our reviews on the nine nominated Best Pictures 
Oscar nominated best pictures on or whatever movies.com or wherever you get podcasts 818-835-0473 or whatever movies at gmail.com. We love to hear from you. Please subscribe to our podcast and please be in touch. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.